Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, what's happening is criminal. Beijing kicks an Al Jazeera correspondent out of China while taking its story to the world in multiple languages. Our web video of the week also comes from China. Rabbits in the eye of the tiger. It's not easy to report the news in Zimbabwe. Now the country is sending people to court just for watching the news. And Rebecca Brooks, out of the frying pan at the Levison Inquiry and into the fire. She's facing charges in the phone hacking scam. Over the past few weeks, we've come to know three names coming out of China. Boa Zhilai, Chen Guancheng, and Melissa Chan. Bo, the fallen politician, and Chen, the blind dissident, were both political stories notable for the way the global news media covered them. The American-born Chan was Al Jazeera's Beijing correspondent before she became the first foreign reporter in 14 years to be banned from reporting from China for reasons the authorities have yet to specify. As a media story, China keeps getting bigger. Chinese commentators, some of them no friends of the Communist Party, think the country is getting a raw deal from foreign news organizations. Beijing is fighting that through the use of soft power. It's reportedly spending $6 billion on a media push that includes new or upgraded news channels broadcasting in English, Arabic, Spanish, and Russian. Our starting point this week is Beijing, where a looming superpower is determined to get its version of the China story out to the world. China has now a variety of media. 20 years ago, it didn't. The people have both information and a voice which they didn't have before. They're learning to cope with it, but the control instinct is there. Who sets the agenda for the Chinese story? Western media or Chinese media? This is Chongqing, a metropolis. Al Jazeera's Melissa Chan reporting from China for what looks like the last time. And until a couple of weeks ago, Bo Xilai's turf. Chan says this story on the political demise of leadership hopeful Bo Xilai had nothing to do with her expulsion and that no reason was given. Foreign journalists must abide by Chinese law. But two months ago, she did a story on black jails the authorities may have disapproved of. Family members not informed of the disappearances of their loved ones by police. And late last year, Al Jazeera aired a documentary alleging prisoners were being used as a kind of slave labor force. Melissa Chan had nothing to do with that program, but it may have been a case of guilt by association. This is the first expulsion in more than a decade, so I think to look into it as the beginning of any kind of pattern or shift would be premature. But there is a very interesting Chinese saying, which is that you kill the chickens to scare the monkeys. And in this case, I may have been the sacrificial chicken to warn other foreign journalists from looking at sensitive stories. She stone a piece on the black prison in China and uh, wow I mean if you are a Chinese person if you hear this story you will see wow this is very sensitive you got to be careful when we, when we decided to do that piece from my point of view I think this is definitely one of the reasons why she got expelled it's a place for police to capture people without arrest without charge and basically disappear them the Chinese government won't be happy about that uh, she's a very feisty aggressive reporter uh, and also unfortunate uh, because according to reports, it seems that um, the government do that because of their displeasure over a documentary on, quote, prison slaves in China, which is not her work. It tells on the raw nerve, it's a subject they don't want. It may also be that it's very irritating for um uh, some Chinese officials, conservative officials somewhere, we don't know their names, we hardly know which department they're in, that there should be an ethnic Chinese who is perhaps, in their view, unremittingly hostile. What's happening is criminal. The Chinese political calendar may have also been a factor. The Communist Party convenes later this year to choose new leadership. Just as China loosened the rules for reporters for the Beijing Olympics in 2008, Foreign correspondents will be given press freedom during the Olympics. 
it may be tightening the rules ahead of the party congress. I'd always said that what would be most interesting about China is not what happens ahead of the Olympics or during the Olympics, but after the party was over. This has very much been borne out. It's getting more difficult to report, more difficult to take interviews. The people we interview are constantly intimidated by local police officers. Just stop here. This year is what I call the year of living dangerously for journalists. Uh, in the sense that because we're moving into the 18 parties Congress or leadership positions at the top. And the government is also very worried about the social media and the uh, internet. Uh, so this year is a very, very sensitive year. And the Chinese government will, um, you know, will be very cautious on any kind of foreign you know, reports on Chinese affairs, domestic affairs, international affairs as well. So I guess this year has been quite hard for foreign journalists to work in China because of the whole the big event taking place. And now foreign journalists are also targets. Beijing often accuses foreign media of paying disproportionate attention to human rights in China and hyping stories for reasons of ideology. There was this recent editorial in The Economist which suggested that one man, the dissident Chen Guangcheng, could single-handedly transform a country of more than 1.3 billion people. It was ridiculous hyperbole. This kind of uh, suggestion is nonsense. Uh, I'm not saying it can never happen, but the idea it's going to happen with Chun seems to be so hugely unlikely, you have to ask the question, what lies in the writer's mind when they start their leader like that? There's another example. In March this year, there was a very interesting article on China's defence and the fact that the Chinese are spending much more money on defence. But if you look at a bar chart of the amount that is spent by other countries on defence, particularly the United States, you will realise that this expan so-called expansion of Chinese military might is absolutely pathetic by comparison. It's sensationalism. Contrast that with China's growing media might, which is real. Beijing is spending billions to counter the dominant Western news narrative through outlets like CCTV, a slick alternative to other global news channels. This is state-owned television that looks nothing like state-run television. Your link to Asia. And, you know, their anchors were ethnically much more diverse than I expected. So it felt like Actually, they were searching for establishing, you know, a relatively open channel as the means by which to present, give themselves a platform uh, in the world. Yeah, they're trying to learn how to engage international audience. But in terms of how successful they are, I'm not quite sure about that. But when it comes to their news programs, people think it's still a bit boring, not engaging and people are still suspicious of that, the way they do news. We need to look at its editorial content. How has it been covering the Bo Xi Lai political scandal? Is the Chen Guangchen case even being covered? And if there's any level of censorship that's going to take away from the credibility of any news organization, the day CCTV, Chinese state media, decides to put the Dalai Lama on for an interview is the day that they're going to gain some level of credibility. Now that would be news. But until something like that happens, Beijing's soft power media push will feel like a hard sell. And much of the world outside China still isn't buying. Our Global Village Voices now. This week we get a student perspective on the coverage of news coming out of China. I've been following German, English and American media with regards to their coverage on China and always came across the fact that strangeness is one thing that is really selling in terms of reportage on China and also then this thing of the huge economic success on China and I think that's mostly it so we don't hear more about the culture, the people, what people in other parts of the country are doing not only in Beijing and Shanghai. I think CCTV English Channel is not doing a good job to fill the gap, uh, the cultural gap left by Western media coverage. They have spending a lot of time and energy on reporting the culture, but they have confused ideological culture with traditional Chinese culture, which is amazing and fantastic. Yeah, I think the Chinese foreign language program are quite embarrassing because for us, uh, domestic market, we don't really look at them, those programs. We, sometimes we look at just for learning language. And in terms of its foreign markets, I think they are less informative. 
Time now for listening post news bites. There's been a significant legal development in the phone hacking scandal that continues to affect Britain's political and media establishments. Rebecca Brooks, the former chief executive of Rupert Murdoch's British newspaper wing, has been charged with three counts of attempting to pervert the course of justice. The charges all relate to alleged offenses from last July, including the removal of documents and computers to hide them from detectives investigating phone hacking at the News of the World tabloid. Five other people, including Brooks's husband and her personal assistant, have also been charged. Rebecca Brooks was first questioned last year as part of Operation Weeding set up by the London Metropolitan Police to investigate the phone hacking scandal. I am baffled by the decision to charge me today. In a statement made to the cameras after the announcement was made, Brooks called the decision weak and unjust. The charge was laid shortly after Brooks took the stand at the Levison inquiry, where, among other statements, she chided the inquiry's lawyer, saying he needed better sources. Where is it from? Uh, various sources, but um, <laughs> I would laugh. <laughs> A Mexican presidential candidate has been accused of getting favorable media coverage through illegal means by buying it. A newspaper called Reforma has alleged that the candidate, Enrique Peña Nieto, paid more than $2 million to journalists for positive media mentions during his time as a state governor. The newspaper published receipts it says it obtained through a freedom of information request. According to those receipts, a news anchor at Televisa, Joaquin Lopez Doriga, is said to have received more than $600,000. The receipts also show payments were made to two radio stations. Nieto, the candidate, hit back at the allegations claiming that the payments were made for sponsorships, not for news coverage. Staying with Mexico, a journalist working for Nieto's party has been found dead. The body of René Horta Salgado was discovered about 50 miles outside of Mexico City. Salgado had worked as a reporter for the El Sol de Cuernavaca newspaper before becoming the head of a political group backing Nieto. A Moroccan rapper has been sentenced to one year in prison after the posting of a video on YouTube that the musician insists had nothing to do with him. The singer's name is Muad Belguad, and he did write a song called Hilab Ad Daula, or Dogs of the State, denouncing police corruption in Morocco. Belguat often raps about poverty and injustice in that country, and he's a prominent figure within the pro-reform February 20th movement. A court in Casablanca found Belguat guilty of showing contempt towards public servants and state institutions. The main evidence in the case was a video posted on YouTube set to the song, which included a photo montage of a policeman with the head of a donkey. But Belguat has said that he has no connection with that video. It was conceived, edited, and posted by a fan he does not know. Still, he was convicted and sentenced. Unlike other Arab leaders, King Mohammed VI has kept popular anger in Morocco under control, partly by introducing a series of reforms, including a new constitution affirming the right to freedom of expression. Critics say Belguat's conviction is at odds with those guarantees. His lawyers say they will appeal. A member of parliament in Iran has found himself the victim of some political blowback from mischief-making cartoonists working on the World Wide Web. The MP's name is Ahmad Lotfi Ashtiani, and he took offense at this cartoon, which was drawn by Mahmoud Shokraya, which appeared in an Iranian newspaper. It depicted what was seen as Ashtiani's interference in Iranian football matters. The case was taken to court. The cartoonist was sentenced to 25 lashes. But that triggered a campaign by other cartoonists who posted their own versions of the MP, none of which was particularly kind. This one from Martin Rousam at The Guardian's UK newspaper showed the politician in a diaper. The Brazilian cartoonist Carlos Latouf had Ashtiani as a caveman. Eventually, the MP came to his senses, he withdrew the complaint, and Shokraya, the cartoonist, was spared the lashes. One of the political byproducts of the Arab Spring has been a case of nerves among leaders of countries with democratic credentials that are less than stellar. Zimbabwe is one such place. The government in Harare is so concerned these days that three months ago it prosecuted six of its citizens for simply gathering and screening video of news coverage of the Arab revolutions.
This is a story about change that has not happened. It's been more than three years now since Robert Mugabe's ZANU-PF party and Morgan Changirai's movement for democratic change signed a power-sharing deal that promised wide-scale reform of the country's media. Zimbabweans, starved of information and still getting a steady diet of pro-Mugabe propaganda, continue to work on new ways to circumvent official censorship. The Listening Post's Nick Muirhead now on how, even in the digital age, sometimes the best way for people to get the news is to pick up the phone. The Arab Spring was a story seen by billions on millions of TV screens around the world. But in Zimbabwe, simply following that story could land you in jail. In the wake of the Arab Spring, 45 Zimbabwe activists gathered to watch footage of the uprising in Egypt. They were rounded up, arrested, and charged with treason. Because people were watching a video of what was happening in Egypt. It's rubbish. A few were released uh, until we had uh, six of them who were charged with treason. And then these charges were whittled down from treason to inciting public violence. They were given suspended sentences and ordered to do community service. The example here was, we are arresting these people for merely watching video footage. Can you imagine what will happen to you if you actually think of doing this? These are citizens of this country who are exercising that right to celebrate and be happy. After the 2008 election, Robert Mugabe's ZANU-PF and Morgan Tsvangirai's Movement for Democratic Change, the NDC, agreed to share power. But if you want to know who runs the country, just turn on the television. Not only does Mugabe's party still control state media, How would that come about, Your Excellency? It uses it to attack its coalition partners. You can't overtly criticize members of ZANU-PF. You can, of course, call Changirai any name in the dictionary and some that aren't. The state media is an appendage of ZANU-PF. It is used time and time and again to insult members of the MDC or anyone in opposition. One of the stipulations of the power-sharing agreement was to reform the country's media, which by and large has not happened. The MDC called for new broadcasting licenses to be issued to contest the one-sided message on state-run media. To date, not a single television license has been granted and the only two new licenses awarded in radio have gone to the company that publishes The Herald, a blatantly pro-Mugabe newspaper, and the other to Super Mandiwanzira, a businessman with close ties to the ZANU-PF party. The agency that is in charge of awarding licenses is a government-appointed agency that is highly controversial. In 2010, they were appointed irregularly uh, and unilaterally by the uh, Minister of Information, who was a Zana PF minister. The Broadcasting Authority began to issue broadcasting licenses, and only then did the MDC wake up and start complaining about the unconstitutionality of the Broadcasting Authority's members. I will not agree to an election unless reforms, as I agreed, have been implemented. You are tuned into Zimbabwe. Continue. Radio has a strong tradition in Zimbabwe as does the tradition of the spoken word, information being disseminated by word of mouth, and it spreads quickly. European settlers were so taken by the speed at which news travelled across the African plains that they called that word of mouth the Bush Telegraph. And in Zimbabwe today, that history is repeating itself, but with new technology. Freedom Phone is a project that came out of the constrained media environment in Zimbabwe. We built the platform to provide ourselves with an additional tool that we could use to reach out to mobile phone users. We find in Zimbabwe that we have difficulty getting power, we have difficulty accessing internet, but the one thing everybody in Zimbabwe has is a mobile phone. So, with Freedom Phone what you do is, it's based on IVR, Interactive Voice Response. So you call in and you get a menu, and in these menus you can get Shona, English and Debele and you get information on those menus. The important feature of Freedom Phone that distinguishes it is the fact that it focuses on voice. So this particular medium is important when we deal with communities who are illiterate. In any society, knowledge is power, 
but Zimbabwe's economic reality can make knowledge prohibitively expensive. To make a call, one minute is 23 cents. The average piece of audio on Freedom Phone is about three to five minutes. So that's roughly a dollar that you spent. And the average Zimbabwean earns less than $250 a month. So it becomes very difficult to justify. This is not the first initiative to target mobile phone users in Zimbabwe. SW Radio Africa is a station that broadcasts into the country from the UK. It attempted a similar phone tech service around the turbulent presidential elections in 2008, but fell victim to its own popularity. Every day we would um, SMS the news headlines for the day. And within months we had about 30,000 subscribers on our you know, SMS list who were in Zimbabwe. And the unfortunate bit was the more people we got onto the list, the more expensive sending out the SMSs became. And we soon ran out of funds. MDC itself tried to do the same thing and set up a hotline uh, with news and information about the party. But there was a big argument about it broadcasting and it was very quickly over because Econet then was threatened with the withdrawal of its license if it continued to run that service. Freedom Phone has also been chased by BAS, the Broadcasting Authority of Zimbabwe, which says that it needs a broadcasting license. Freedom Phone argues that it's a telephony service that shouldn't require a license. And bureaucratic obstacles are not the only ones that the organization faces. There are issues with accuracy of information, um, verifying information, and there's also security implications, knowing that Zimbabwe has a surveillance law that allows the government to eavesdrop on telecommunications. So there are very serious technical uh, security and economic impediments that have slowed the wide use of the Freedom Phone in Zimbabwe. But the trials of citizens for merely watching news of the Arab revolutions and the tribulations of Zimbabweans trying to spread news on mobile phones, these stories send a message to the powers that be in Harare. Politicians are not the only ones with a voice, not the only ones who want to be heard. More Global Village voices now on the media story in Zimbabwe. Information is power, information is knowledge, so ZANU-PF is fully aware that by enlightening as many Zimbabweans, their grip to power will be threatened. They have always said a gun is mightier than the pen. They will try their level best to suppress the human rights of the journalists so that as many Zimbabweans remain as ignorant and not aware of what is happening in the world. The media landscape in Zimbabwe has improved somewhat. Um, since the coalition government came into being, um, a number of print media organizations have been licensed. And so have two broadcasters, but the broadcasters are both aligned to ZANU-PF. Finally, our web video of the week is produced by the Chinese animator and provocateur P. San. His animations have a habit of going viral before the censors in Beijing begin deleting links from social media sites. P. San's most famous creation is Kuang Kuang, a mischievous schoolboy. The video we're showing you depicts a dream the boy had about a world in which rabbits are ruled by tigers. Now, the symbolism is well known to the Chinese. The rabbits represent the population, the tigers are the authorities. This video is estimated to have been watched by three to four million people over just two days before the censors caught up with it. Our viral video of the week might be the closest thing China has to the American animation series South Park. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post. <laughs>
Dream.